2 Thessalonians, I want to continue where we left off last week on speaking about an inconvenient truth. And, and truth sometimes comes to us, and it may seem inconvenient to the flesh. But what God is doing is He's bringing us into a closer walk with who He is. And He wants to draw us closer and closer to Himself. And this is why we have to be so occupied and preoccupied with the things of Christ and with the Word of God and with prayer and the things that draw us closer to God. You know, I, I, I learned in, in, in Bible school what the definition of religion was. And religion in itself is really not a bad thing because it's actually the activities that draw us closer to God. But when those activities stop drawing us closer to God, then all we have is activities. And that's, called, and that's just dead religion. But true religion is feeding the poor. Going out and, and showing mercy and living a life that Jesus Christ not only taught us, but as actually working with us in the Great Commission. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we want to pick up right here. Verse 1, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, that the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. There's so much that uh, is going on in, these, in this day and age and you know, and, and it's such a hope, such, a, such an awesome thing to understand and to know that Jesus Christ is coming again. And it's so powerful for us as believers to understand this. The believers all through the ages had, knew, had known that Jesus Christ was coming. They all believed with, with, with an expectant hope that Jesus would return in their day. But I can say with, with just utter conviction this morning, I believe that we will see the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Not just in spirit, not just in power, but in, but in, in, in actuality, we will see Jesus return. Now, as we were saying last week, that the man of sin that is here uh, described in verse 3 is not the same man of sin that is described in verse 8, and we'll get there in just a few minutes, because the man in verse 3, it's in small letters, and, and God, what he is doing is revealing truth to you and I, that there is, there is something in you and I that it's the, it's the natural man that does not know Jesus Christ, and, and that natural man tends to exalt itself above everything that is called God. You can look at it in Romans chapter 1, and Paul deals with it, that when they knew God, they didn't glorify Him as God, but exalted and worshipped the creature more than the Creator, therefore making themselves gods. And so therefore they exalted that thing that was in them. You see, and Paul speaks of the, of Antichrist coming, and he says, and that Antichrist spirit is already at work. And you see, we sometimes are thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Paul puts it all in reference, and reference to the coming of Jesus Christ, there, there would be a great falling away before that day comes. Why? That the man of sin, not, not, we're not talking about the Antichrist at this moment, but the man of sin in us. That carnal man, that flesh, that desire, that thing that is always trying to war against the things of God. And there is a warring in you and me today. You find it, you face it in your own life. There's a warring of stubbornness. And, and here's the warning. It's against the stubbornness that is in us. And finally, it's a warning against idolatry 
brought on, brought on by doctrines of devils that exalts the flesh above the creator. You see, and we have so much that is, that is being preached and being taught today in, in, in the world and in the churches. And, and we see it. It's a selfish thing. It's a, it's a self-exaltation. And the lines of communication between us and God are breaking down. And all along the line, this doctrine is lying. And it's a doctrine of a devil. Men are trying to build their, their own false foundations and their own religions and their own doctrines uh, and, and building their own kingdoms and trying to gather to themselves followers. The Bible says in the last days that they would find themselves men that would itch their ears and tell them that what they wanted to hear and that in the end time that they would not be able to endure sound doctrine. And this is all a part of the man of sin that Christ is exposing through, through the Holy Spirit in you and me. But we have to be willing to hear what Christ is saying. Remember we said, refuse not him that speaks. Because if we refuse the Spirit of God that is speaking to you and I today, then we are in trouble. You see, we're influenced by all sorts of, of, of contradictions and considerations, influenced by what others will say and what others think, especially those in religious circles or people of our own tradition their false considerations and false influences if they do not exalt Christ above everything else. See, we find this, and it's, and it's so disheartening to me, because we want to believe what we want to believe. And as I said last week, I'm willing to listen to anyone that truly loves God. You see, I have not set myself so much just because of the things that maybe I've been taught that, that I am not willing to see what God is really wanting to speak to me. And when I look at the Word of God, I do not come to, it, to the Word of God to try to make it somehow fit what I want it to fit, to, to fit and to say what I want it to say. I look at the, the Word of God and I ask God, God, what are you trying to say to me? Because ultimately you're in control and I'm not. And I want truth in my life. I don't know about you, but I want truth. And sometimes when I'm confronted with truth, I don't really like it. But I need it. And see, and when it comes to that, so much of the world doesn't want to hear what you and I have to say. And it's a gospel. That's why it's an inconvenient truth because the inconvenience comes from the flesh that's trying to exalt itself above everything that is God. Now the Bible says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and he tells us that that man of sin wants to sit in the temple of God. In other words, sitting in the place of your heart where only God deserves. And so therefore we exalt ourselves above above God himself by not obeying God and we sit in rebellion against the truth of his word. You see, many times what people will try to do is, is they, 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 they pray about something, right? And then what happens next? Okay, God, if this is your will. And then, and then they read the scripture. Well, no, that, doesn't, that was, didn't say what I wanted it to say. And so they try it again. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to get God to agree with something that he will not agree with. Listen to me, you don't have to question if it's in the will of God, if you're abiding in the word of God and you're living according to his will, you won't have to just put your finger somewhere. You can walk in the knowledge of his spirit and his presence, living by the truth of his word, even when it is inconvenient for you and for me. So living by truth. Now I want you to consider this thought. We are living by truth, but there's no truth in in you and I by our own nature. There's no truth in you and I by our own nature. And this is a hard thing to understand and a hard thing to consider because, because we have to learn to live in truth. You see, as we talked about on Wednesday, Satan came in and he struck us with that poisonous, poisonous venom and all of the human race was therefore condemned to hell. 
And we were born in sin and born in iniquity. And therefore there is no truth in us apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we begin consequently to learn to live the life of truth. So we discover this, the only answer for deliverance and to break away from all of it is not in what I am, but it is who he is. And it's not just who he is, but, but here's the thing, who is he in you? You see, Christ, he remains the same. He has never changed. We change. We go through changes. But he has remained the same. So what is truth? What is truth? It's that which stands up against all arguments of Satan, who is ultimately a liar and the father of it who is constantly trying to deceive you and I. I, I want you to go with me to 1 John. This is a scripture that, that has just become so dear to me that God has just been really working on me and, and really revealing this more and more all the time to me in just a little bit of a, a, a greater way. In 1 John chapter 2, if you would, in verse 8, and some of you already know where we're going. The Bible says that he that committeth sin is of the devil. Now, God doesn't mix words. And he, 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 when, when, when John wrote this, the Bible says that he was in, influenced by the Holy Spirit himself. So he says, he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. For this reason, Jesus came to the earth. For this reason, Jesus was manifested as the Son of God, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Therefore, whosoever is born of God, read it there. What does it say? Come on, read it out loud. In verse, in verse 9, whoever is born of God does not commit sin. Now, 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 for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, now see, we, we get into this, and, and we don't like to read that. Why? Because there's sin in us. And we're always fighting against it. But see, somehow we get all tangled up in it. And somehow we think, well, well and, and so we take out and we pull out the grace card. And we say, oh, well, grace, grace, grace. Now, now, now Paul says that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. But, but God, Paul doesn't give us a license to sin. He says, so therefore, do we sin that grace may abound? And what does he say? God forbid that we continue to do such. But we have used grace as a license to sin rather than the power of God in our lives to overcome that sin that we might grow closer and closer to God and therefore putting off the old man little by little and Christ becoming more and more in us. Now this is a doctrine that I'm sure that many of you, maybe you have to go back to when even you were a kid that used to be preached almost every Sunday Every time you went to church when, when you were a child. But all of a sudden, it's not a, it's not a, a doctrine or a scripture that, that anybody wants to even touch or, or go near. Because it's very offensive and it's an inconvenient thing to the flesh. Because the flesh likes to sin. And so therefore, it's, it's kind of like the, the teaching that Jesus gives in the very act that when he, and, and I'll never forget a, a message that was preached by, by my pastor uh, in, in McAllen, Pastor Barker at one time, and, and the title of it was, was, Solve My Problems But Save My Pigs. And that title never left me, because so many of us, that's what we want. We, we want God to solve our problems but we don't want him to touch any of the, the junk that's in our lives. 
And can I tell you this? God doesn't work that way. So what is truth? It stands up against all the arguments of Satan. He's a liar. He's the father of it. Jesus Christ has come to undo all the works of the devil. Not just in the world, but as we see in the scripture in 1 John, to do un- to undo all the works of the devil that have been made in you and manifest in you and me. Why? Because his seed is in us and therefore there should be fruit that is coming out when we live a life that is godly and holy. Now, before I get ahead of myself, continue with me in 2 Thessalonians because there's so much more to say on this and I don't want to go out of turn here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 5 says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Verse 6, And now you know that withholding that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Let me, let me say that again. The mystery of iniquity is already working right now. It's already at work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So truth then is that which delivers us from this false self which we are. See, Satan doesn't have a problem with you coming to church as long as you're not delivered from this false self. You see, we, we try to fix up the self. We try to, we try to uh, uh, almost just, just condition the self. We, we think that it doesn't need anything but a little bit of, uh, of you know, manipulating here and manipulating there. And so we try to do all the things that we can to work on self. Can I tell you what self, what has to be done with self? Self must be crucified. Self has to die. Self has to die. See, man is not true in any part of his being. Christ alone is truth. And you and I have to learn how to live in Christ. And we can't do this on our own. We need the Holy Spirit of God to do this in us. To conform us into the image of Christ himself. So if we're going to live uh, uh, on a false basis of ourself, then, then the Holy Spirit, he, he lets us and he leaves us alone because he's not going to barge in and he's not going to force you to do something that you don't want to do. Now, if you're a child of his, he will reprimand you, he will discipline you, and he will help us to become like Christ when we begin to go off course. But when we come to him, we have to live by faith. Now, now this is a whole nother message, and we'll have to talk about it a whole nother time. But let me just touch on it if I can. You see, when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to live by faith. Faith, you know, it's, it's a hard thing sometimes because, because our natural man is so used to living by the things that it sees, it feels, it hears, it touches. And faith calls us out into the things that we cannot see, the things that we, that, that we cannot necessarily touch with the flesh. But the only way that we will ever experience it is when we take that first step. And God will never reveal himself until you take that first step of blind faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, now I know that I've, I've said this before, but, but in Hebrews chapter 11, you put that in, that in there where faith is, and you, put, you replace that with the word of God. The word of God is the substance of things hoped for, and the word of God is the evidence of things that are not yet seen. You have to trust in what God has spoken to you and to me. And therefore, faith is acting upon the word of God as an absolute. 
There were, therefore we know because God said, therefore we do. And whatever God has said, therefore we act upon it and we do. So the, the Holy Spirit comes and he'll make good in us what Christ reveals to us. But Satan is always trying to get in to the spirit through the body, the soul. He's trying to, to capture and, and gain that stronghold in the spirit so that he can bring you and I into bondage. See, we can remain free inwardly even though everything on the outward seems like it's, it's bound up. You may, you may not feel like you're free, but you can be free. You, you might be bound this morning by a sickness, but that doesn't mean that that sickness controls who you are and who God is in you. They're your circumstances shouldn't bind you. It is Christ who sets you free. And we don't live by our feelings. We don't live by our emotions. But we live according to the faith of the Son of God. So we're free. And this is the truth. It's not a thing. It's not an affirmation. It's a person. And his name is Jesus Christ that has come to set us free. See, as we abide in Christ, there's rest. As we abide in Christ, there's peace. As we abide in Christ, there is deliverance. I want to take you somewhere, if you will. In Galatians chapter 2, I, I, I know it's a familiar passage of Scripture, but I want you to see something. The spiritual life is about Jesus Christ. Everything, everything is about Jesus Christ. Let no one deceive you. I, I, I love it, as I've said in Matthew chapter 24, and, and you don't have to turn there yet, but, but, but when the disciples said, so what are we going to know? The time of your coming and all of these things are at hand. T tell us. And the first thing that Jesus says is, beware that no one deceives you. And, and then again, Paul says over here in 2 Thessalonians, he says, he says, don't let anyone deceive you. You see, when, when we're talking about the end times, when we're talking about these things, don't let anyone deceive you. Everything has to do with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ didn't save you so that you could go on and live oblivious to who he is. But he saved you so that you could learn of him and so that you could become like him. And so this is what Paul says. Go with me to verse 18. He says, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. But he says, For, for though the law, for, for though the law, am, I'm dead to the law, that I might live unto God. In verse 20, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And see, and this is, it's almost a contradiction of terms. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet who lives? What does he say next? I, I, but I don't live. I live, but I, but I don't live. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by, by, by what? By the faith, and I, and I want you to hear how it, how it says it in the King James Version. By the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I want you to get this, if you will, this morning. Therefore, now that I am crucified, meaning my old life is dead, and Christ now lives in me, and yet I'm walking in the flesh, but yet the Spirit of God lives in me, Therefore, I'm not living according to my own faith. I'm living according to the faith of the Son of God, which is in me. It is the faith of Jesus Christ in me. So this is the thing. I have to learn to live by the faith of Christ Jesus alone. I'm reminded of a story when that... that, that uh, Smith Wigglesworth had spoken when he had gone to a friend's house and his friend had laid there in the bed dead. 
And he said he sat in that room and he began to pray for him. And, and Wigglesworth was, was, a, was a powerful, great man of God, but a humble man of God. And he sat there and he said, and it came to a point where, where his faith had come to an end. And he sat there and, and, and his friend was laying dead on the bed and his faith had come to an end. And he said, and I had no more faith. And he said, and all of a sudden, the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ stepped into that room and he began to pray and his friend got up from that bed. You see, a lot of times we're so still stuck in the elementary. We're still stuck in the first stages of where we are rather than moving on into the deeper things of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says this. He says, who loved me and gave himself for me. But then he goes on to say something else in verse 21 that I think is so powerful because it's for those that would say we are not saved by works and we're not saved by works. I know that. But I can tell you this, if there are not works, you're not saved. You say, wait a minute. Then ask James, the brother of Jesus. He said that faith that without works is dead. It's no faith at all. But a faith that really works, it has fruit. There is something that comes out of it. It's a life that is living, a life that is following Christ, a life that is becoming like Jesus Christ. And if your faith is not changing you, then your faith is dead. And I'm not saying that to, to be mean. I'm not saying that to, to, to somehow say that you're saved by work. No, we know that. But if there are not works, I would question your faith. Because listen what he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ died in vain. He says, I'm not frustrating the grace of God here by telling you that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And now, now the, the life that I live, I live according to the Son of God, meaning that there is something, there is fruit. You're seeing something in me, and you should, we should be able to see something in you if Christ truly lives in you. Because as he was in this world, so are we. And everything that he did, he said we would do. And so God is constantly bringing us into a closer and a deeper relationship with who he is. In his whole thing, you go back to Romans chapter 8 and you'll find it. His whole dealing with you and me is to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Amen. To make us like Christ. Paul's whole life was spent on this. And you can see it. As Paul walks everything that he does. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. See Christ alone is truth. And you and I have to learn to walk in Christ if we are going to walk in truth. And we cannot do this on our own. We need the Holy Spirit to help us. So if we're going to live upon the false basis and foundation that we have created, then the Spirit of God, He will continue to allow us. But Satan, he constantly is warring. And there is a war going on in your flesh. The Bible talks about the war of the Spirit and the war between the Spirit and the flesh. And they're looking and they're Fighting for supremacy in you and in me. And therefore we need Christ to come and make the difference. See the Holy Spirit will never save us by some kind of an it. He always delivers us through the person of Jesus Christ. It was Christ that delivered you. I don't know where you got saved. I don't know what happened to you. But I can tell you this. There's a common denominator with everyone that is saved and that is a believer of Jesus Christ. They had an encounter with Jesus Christ. They didn't get saved by some id or something out there. They got saved by Jesus Christ. Just as Peter was walking on the water and Christ reached down and took him. The same thing happened to you and to me. So there's, a, there's an abiding need of faith. The work of the Holy Spirit is therefore to conform us to Christ himself. See, Jesus is God's absolute delight and he is going to bring Christ out in us. That is his whole working. That's why it's so hard sometimes. Because You, you know why? Because I can tell you this. Pastor Rick... 
is not a lot like Christ apart from Christ. And, and so, so, so when the potter gets a hold of this clay of mine and he begins to, to form and to mold and to press, and I tell you this, sometimes it's very difficult and it's painful and it hurts but the more I resist, the more it hurts. And so therefore I'm learning. And I'd love to tell you, oh man, I've learned it and I'm already perfect. But even as Paul said, not that I'm already perfect. But I'm learning that, that the more I submit and the more that I humble myself and the more that I'm willing, the easier it is. Doesn't mean that it's easy, but the easier it gets. But the more I resist and I fight against what God wants to do in my life, the harder it is. And therefore, it's easier to walk away. It's easier to give up on what God is doing when I'm resisting God. But see that you resist not him that speaks. So the thing that God is going to do and focus on is the the idolatry in our heart and in our life. And everything... Everything in your life and mind that does not glorify who Jesus Christ is. What do you mean? I don't get to have any compartment of my life to myself? No. For me to live is what? Christ. For me to live is not me plus Christ. For me to live is not, you know, my... my, I don't even want to go there. I want, I, you need to walk with Christ. The Bible says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What is it that Christ has been dealing with you on and you're not willing to give to him and you've been resisting him on it? What is it that doesn't glorify Christ in your life that God has been dealing with you and dealing with you and dealing with you and yet you're resisting him? Whatever that position is, it might be something you're listening to. It may be something you're watching. It may be somewhere you're going. It may be something in your life and you keep resisting Christ and you keep saying, well, I've given everything else to Christ. Can I at least keep this? You know the answer to that. Stop fighting him. See, if there's anything in me that I would choose over Christ, God is going to bring that ultimately to the surface of my life. You see, this is what happens when that that gold or that silver is heated to its apex. All the impurities come up to the top. Why do you go through trials and why do you you have to face some of the things that you're facing so that all the impurities can come up to the top? Then it's your job and mine to deal with the things that come up to the top. It's your job and mine that when something is exposed that is not of Christ, it's your job and mine to deal with that thing. But sometimes what we do is we just like to say, you know what, I, I, I know, but I'm not ready yet, and let me just tuck that back away, and we'll deal with it another day, knowing that, that we really don't want to deal with it because we've become awfully comfortable. We've become awfully comfortable with it. And so Christ brings those things up. See, and, and here's the thing. If you and I really want to walk in a deeper relationship with God, is God doesn't make any deals. God isn't here to make a deal with you or with me. You see, as we said, Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has never changed. Even though that may sometimes seem difficult, I can tell you this, I've found so much comfort in the fact that Jesus Christ never changes. You know why? Because no matter what I'm facing, no matter how mature I get, no matter how childish I used to be, I can always come back to Christ and he's still the same. You see, I may, I may admit something or, 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 or something might not be wrong to me today. I can tell you this. I've come a long way since I first came to know Jesus Christ. And maybe there were some things back then that weren't necessarily wrong to me, but they were withholding me from a deeper walk with God and God said you needed to get rid of that and back then I might have liked it but God was always the same on that issue and on that fact and even though I may have changed he never changed and so he's bringing you and I closer to to him 
John says this in John 3 and 30 that he must, come on somebody, increase, but I must decrease. Now, now I want to read that again, but I want to put an emphasis. He must, he must increase. You must decrease. We must. This isn't an option. This is not God making a deal. He says either you do or don't. I want it all or I don't want any of it. You see, let me ask you, when Christ died on the cross, did he purchase part of you or did he purchase the whole thing? If you go to heaven, what part of you goes to hell? None of you. Because he purchased you. Body, soul, and spirit. He purchased you. And somehow we want to hold it back and withhold from him what rightfully belongs to him. He is the master. We are the bond servants. I am here not against my will. I am here because he has done something so awesome and so powerful. And I'm so grateful to him. And so he is not holding me hostage. Nothing is holding me here. I am here by my own will. And therefore, if I'm here by my own will, then I must be willing to obey his commandments. See, God is committed to you and I. Until Christ is formed in us. The flesh wars against that. It doesn't want any part of it. The Bible talks about the flesh wars against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. So that we cannot do the things that we ought to do. There's a battle that is going on. And it's a real thing in you and I. See the thing to do is to get into Christ with all of your heart. With all of your soul, with all of your mind, and never look back. What have you left in that world that you want to go back to? What is there in that world that has anything to offer to you and to me? What is there in that world that brings hope and that brings comfort to you and to me? Can I tell you, there's nothing in the world that I left out there that I want to go back to. But somehow Satan comes in and deceives. And if, we, and if we're not walking with Christ continually, and if he's not continually increasing, and we're not continually decreasing, then the world begins to creep back into us. And our flesh begins to become greater in us than the spirit in us. And then all of a sudden, you start thinking about, oh, what you gave up. And it won't be until you get back out there, you'll realize you didn't give anything up. But you'll be held in bondage again. So it's up to us to walk in the beginnings, in the beginnings of that new light and the experience with God until the full light arises in our hearts. And one of my favorite passages of scripture, Proverbs 4 and 18, is something that that is so powerful. It says, "But but the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. It shines more and more. What does it mean? That, that you and I started on a journey and there was, a, there was some light in us. But, but the longer I walk with God, the greater that light becomes. And, and, it's, and it's as if I'm walking towards the sun. And <laughs> the closer I get, the brighter that sun becomes in my life and over me. And, and the more that I live with Christ and, and live for Christ, the more I should look like Christ. I shouldn't become bitter. I shouldn't become uh, unforgiving. I shouldn't become any of those things. If anything, it should be the complete opposite. I should become more and more like Jesus Christ. I should walk more and more and look more and more like him. So if you and I are, are going to <coughs> the, the opposite direction that God wants us to go, then I can tell you this. He has a way of taking us around the desert and making us come around full circle until we finally come to the understanding that we need to begin to live According to his ways. And the just shall live by faith. And we are going to be like him. 
If we truly want to be, and we keep, if we keep walking around in that desert, he'll let us. But each time, I pray that we get closer and closer to what he wants us to be. That every time they came to Kadesh Barnea, they, they, they came closer and closer to the promised land. But don't let it be like the Israelites that died in the desert. Don't you dare die without the faith of the Son of God working in you. So as we walk in the beginnings of the understanding, God is going to meet us and he's going to reveal to us the covetousness of our own heart. He's going to reveal to us who we are and what we are. And, and, and the, the, the light that we walk in is going to grow greater and greater. So God is not going to make an exception with you. He's not going to make an exception with me. Somehow we get this in our mind that somehow we're favorites and we're this. Yeah, he makes us feel that way, doesn't he? But I can tell you this, Moses, the meekest man that ever lived, when he didn't obey God and when God commanded him to circumcise his son, God was ready to, to take his own life there for, because of disobedience. And because Moses disobeyed God, he wasn't able to walk into the promised land and to see what God had for him. Can I, tell you, can I ask you something? What makes you think that God's going to make an exception for you? We don't have time to get into it all today. But God is going to continue to confront you and I with, this, with, with the true self until Christ is revealed in us. And he's going to deal with the, with the covetousness of our heart. And if he has to strip you and I down to bankruptcy until our reputation doesn't matter, he will do whatever it takes because he's more concerned with your eternal condition than he is your present circumstances. See, God is only interested in Christ being formed in us that we may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. And I want to close in, in reading out of Colossians. And, and I want you to turn with me because I want, to, I want to read a little bit of an extensive part of this, this chapter in Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Because it speaks of an attitude that, that, that wants to please God and walks with, with him that, that God will honor. Somebody that, that wants to please God and walks with him. And these are the ones that God honors. In Colossians chapter 1. You want to come Julio? Starting with verse 10. And I, want to, and I want to stress a few things as we go along. And we're going to do this just a little differently than we normally do. But... That you might walk worthy. You might walk worthy. You see, there's a lot of emphasis upon, upon you can't tell me what to do. And, and if you would, just, just hold on a minute. Don't go reading on ahead. But here's the thing. There's a lot of emphasis in this day and age upon you can't tell me what to do. And, and, and they'll say it in this manner. You can't judge me. You can't. Nobody can tell me what to do. I'm my own person. You're absolutely right. But if you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you give up your will for his. And he has absolute say. Over what happens in your life and mine. I can tell you this. If Christ wanted to, he has every right to walk up into my life today. And, and, and while I'm in that prayer closet or whatever, wherever I may be, he has every right to come up and say, you need to resign that church and I need you to be in Africa tomorrow. What do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to pull a coin out of my pocket. I'm going to say heads and tails. Best two out of three. No, he has every right to walk up into my life today and say, I need this out of you. You see, Paul said, I was with you in fear and in trembling and death often and peril of robbers and perils of thieves and perils of the sea and perils of, of chains and perils of this and perils of that. 
But he was obedient to the faith. And in the end of his life, he was able to say at the very end, he was able to say, I fought the good fight and I finished my course. There's not another soul that I need to witness to. I finished the work that God has called me to do. And now there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Don't you want to get to the end of the road that one day and be able to say the same thing? Listen to what Paul says to the Colossians here. He says that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Who are you trying to please, yourself or him? Him. Being what? Fruitful. Meaning there has to be fruit in your life and in my life. There has to be fruit in our lives, in every good work, <clears throat> in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. I mean, there is so much packed into this one verse alone that we could probably stop here and preach a series of messages right here out of this one verse. That you, can, you and I can walk worthy in all pleasing, being fruitful. And every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I mean, so much packed right here. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. I mean, so powerful. Verse 13. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us uh, into the kingdom of his dear son. He has delivered you and he has delivered me and he is from the power of darkness and he has removed us and placed us into the kingdom of his dear son. And Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. And I can tell you this, if the spirit of God lives in you, then the kingdom of God lives in you. And if the kingdom of God lives in you, then his will be done and not your own. Because thy will be done and not my own. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his. And I don't think I would even be doing an injustice here by saying his precious blood. I've come to love that blood. If you've been here on the Wednesday nights, we've been talking about it for probably the last two, three months. That precious blood of Jesus Christ, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And listen, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. All things were created by him and for him. Everything in your life was by him and everything in your life is for him for his glory and his honor verse 17 and he is before all things and by him all things consist and he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things in all things what he might have preeminence. Does he have first place in your life? Does he have first place in your life? Do you seek him early? Do you seek him first? Does he have preeminence? over your home? Does he have preeminence over your marriage? Does he have preeminence over the things that you watch? Does he have preeminence? I can tell you most of the problems that we have is because he doesn't have preeminence in our lives. He doesn't come 
first. If he doesn't come first, I'm telling you, you're going to continue to have problems. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. Verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your own mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And that's what's happening in your life today. You wonder why am I having the issues that I'm having? Why does it seem that I have to go through some of the things that I'm going through? Can I tell you this? That God is doing something in you because he's working out that salvation in you. And he's going to present you to God perfect in Christ. He's going to present you to God perfect in Christ. That when you stand before God, there's not going to be any if, and, or but. You're going to stand there perfect before God in Christ Jesus. He is working this out in you and in me. He's doing it. He wants you to have something when you get there. He wants to, you to have crowns to offer. He wants you to, to come before him without, without any regard for the sin in those things. Because they've been dealt with. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. If you just hold with me a few more verses. And because this, this verse right here is so powerful. The verse three words in this verse for anyone is if you continue. What do, what do you mean? There's something that you have to do. There's something that I have to do. See, he says, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which has, was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereof I, Paul, am made a minister who now rejoice in my sufferings if you, uh, for you and fill up that which is behind of all the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake which is the church wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me to fulfill the word of God I want to say this but I don't want to be misunderstood you and I have a job to do how can they hear unless somebody preaches? And how can they go unless somebody's willing to send them? So how can they go, how can they hear, and how can they be saved unless they hear this glorious gospel that we are listening to this morning? How can they be saved unless, they're here, unless they hear it? So, so with that in mind, I want to say this without being misunderstood. Christ alone can save the world. But Christ cannot save the world alone. We are the body of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you this? If the body of Jesus Christ is acting like the world, then how does the world get saved? It doesn't. It doesn't. Christ is bringing you so that you and I can be like him so we can finish the work that he has begun. And Luke, when he writes the book of Acts to Theophilus, his beloved friend, he said all that Jesus Christ began to do and to say meaning he was going to finish it through the church that was birthed on the day of Pentecost when he laid down his body and on that day of Pentecost he took up a new body and that was the body of Jesus Christ which he is the head of. 
And as the head of the body, he gets to tell you and I what to do. And he's the one that gets to tell us where we need to go. Your hand doesn't have a mind of its own. It, it's controlled by this mind up here. But all of a sudden, we think our, we're, we're, we're a finger or a hand. We think that we should be able to do what we want to do and we don't have to listen to the head. No, no, no. We have to listen to the head. Because when the body begins to dysfunction in, in a dysfunctional way, if it walks in a dysfunctional way, everybody knows it. But when it all works in accordance to the head, then it can do great and awesome and powerful things. And Christ has given us his mind. That mind is the spirit of the living God. Oh, 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 oh,